Welcome everybody. Um, we are at our st official start time, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I am Dr. Gabriel Orsi, Project Manager with the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. We're located in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Before we dive into today's presentation, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. We are based on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Just taking a moment to acknowledge the rich and complex history of our region. The Northwest MHTTC is part of a National Mental Health Technology Transfer Center network. You can see that we're up serving uh, the Pacific Northwest in that top left corner, but we invite you to take a moment to find your local MHTTC if you're not from our region. We proudly serve Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Our focus is on disseminating evidence-based practices into the workforce through free trainings like this one, as well as offering a resource library, free online courses, and a lot more. Just a word on language before we uh, keep uh, <laughs> get into the meat of our presentation today. We use affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language that is culturally appropriate, strengths-based, and respects a person's dignity, worth, and, and facilitates hope. You can see a little bit more about what we mean by that language on this slide. And I'd like to take a moment to remind folks that we are recording this session for distribution on our website. So please bear in mind um, any issues around confidentiality. A few housekeeping details before we get started with our presenter. This is a, a webinar, so everyone is muted with the camera off just to manage our audience today a little better and make sure everyone has a positive learning experience. We are going to share the recording, the slides, and any resources our presenter points us to through our website. So look for some emails from us um, in a couple weeks with those resources and materials. We'll also offer a certificate to the folks who were here for the live training today. So that will also be generated in about two to three weeks. Okay, so this is a webinar and your options for communication are somewhat limited, but there are a few. One of the tools at your disposal as an audience member is to use the chat. Everyone can see what you chat. Um, I will be responding to messages in the chat about general questions, tech support, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I encourage you to use the Q&A for any subject matter questions. Um, that just keeps them tidy and in one place for us to refer to them. If you can't figure out the Q&A though, that's okay. Feel free to put your content questions in the chat as well. All right. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that our grantor, SAMHSA, requires us to do an evaluation and your feedback is vital to the uh, work we do, improving the work we do, and continuing our funding for trainings like this one. So please, uh, at the end, we'll be sharing a link to the evaluation and we please uh, encourage you to do it. Take a few moments after this training wraps up. Okay, I will not bore you by reading you the disclaimer, but suffice to say that we are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA. And SAMHSA does not take a, an official position on the content here today. Um, this disclaimer will be part of the slide deck that you'll have access to later if you would like to peruse the fine print. Um, so you can see that we're supported by them, but they are not taking a position on today's content. It's my pleasure now to introduce Shauna Kanega from Oregon Family Support Network. She's a family support specialist. She's got deep experience, lived experience in this field. She has worked with elected officials on policy making. Um, you can see a little bit about her, the specifics of her experience, and she's very passionate about the subject. And it is my great pleasure to turn over our presentation uh, now to, to uh, Shauna. So. I'm just going to stop screen sharing and pass the mic.
Shauna, I think you're muted. Of course I am. Welcome to the Zoom universe. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Let me get my uh, slides up here for you and we are going to get started. Thank you all so much for being here. This is a, uh, a large group. I'm a little nervous, but super, super excited to be here. Um, a small disclaimer, I am uh, feeling a little sick, so I'm gonna try my best not to cough today during this webinar, but there, there might be a few moments here and there. So we are going to speak today for a couple hours around family-led crisis planning, how to make it work for you. A few things that uh, we are hoping to accomplish and some goals for today uh, by the time we reach about three o'clock and hopefully have some time for uh, question and answers is really understanding how crisis plans are to be created and used when we're looking at it from a family-driven uh, perspective and a family-driven utilization. Understand why families must lead the planning process. We're gonna look at increasing family voice and choice within the crisis planning process. Uh, seeing how all life domains, all 12 life domains are utilized and involved when looking at comprehensive crisis planning. And then at the very end, really take home some, some practical, practical strategies that you can start using moving forward in guiding a family-driven crisis planning process. So we'll pause here for just one second and um, just say hi. Hi. Uh, you know, we are in a webinar right now. So, you know, I can't see y'all. I kind of feel like I'm just talking to myself and talking to the slides, but please feel free to use the chat. Use the chat and say hi to each other. We have, let's see, about, uh, about 100 people with us today. Um, you know, are, tell, are you here with a provider, professional hat on? Are you here as a family member with lived experience, uh, gaining some new skills, knowledge, and abilities? And, uh, you know, maybe tell us what, what uh, region you're coming from. So, as was told, I am Shauna Kanega, and I am the very, very, very proud uh, mother of an adult child now. So, she's an adult, she's 28, uh, my child still, my baby. Uh, and I am also a uh, grandma of two young, very energetic, very sassy, adorable grandkids. Um, with that, uh, part of why I'm here with you today is my daughter lives with and experiences mental health and behavioral health challenges. Um, really, the key component to that for our journey was around crisis, safety, stability, wellness, and well-being. Um, I've spent about 15 years, um, almost two decades in my career and almost two decades in my lived experience navigating crisis plans, um, trauma, uh, neurobiology, research, and mental health supports and services um, from the need, I guess, for my own family, as well as families that we support and serve in the work that we do. I am a born and bred Oregon native. I have never left, uh, except for maybe to visit or do trainings uh, in other states. And I am also a family support specialist with Oregon Family Support Network. And for those of you who might be new to Oregon Family Support Network, we are the Oregon chapter of the National Federation of Families. So we get the honor and the privilege of doing educational series, empowerment, advocacy, as well as providing family support specialists, what some of you um, might call family to family peer work uh, for families within the state of Oregon. Okay, I see people are using the chat. That is awesome. Uh, saying hi. We've got uh, some names I'm, I'm familiar with and some new names too. We've got Arizona, Illinois. This is so great. Canada. Fabulous. Thank you all so much for being here. So we have limited time and a ton of information, my friends. A ton of information. I hope you find it all useful and absolutely applicable. So let's dive in. One of the first things, if we're going to talk about the systemic shift to family-driven, family-led crisis planning, when it comes to all of you in this space today who are either living the life, walking the journey, or supporting people who are walking this journey um, of mental health for young people and supporting families, 
the three crucial components to start as a foundational um, uh, building blocks is really understanding what is crisis, what does it mean to families, uh, what are the things that lead to it, and how do we kind of start to know that they might be coming. So let's take a look real quick at the foundational, what's a crisis? What is a crisis, right? There are several, several definitions that you could look up in a dictionary or a Wikipedia, you know, really around this idea of uh, intense trouble or difficulty, danger, um, times where these important decisions need to be made, uh, a stressful event, um, some sort of a decisive point or situation where things must be adhered to, dealt with. Um, there's, there's really this important time uh, of, of stressor or difficulty, right? And these could be a variety of areas for a family, an individual, a community. We could look at crisis around job losses, uh, car accidents, um, an eviction notice, houselessness, right? Somebody has an injury or a major illness. Uh, for some, it might be divorce or an assault, right? Crisis and what is a difficulty, what is trouble or danger could be a variety of situations and circumstances in somebody's life. So the next foundational component to these building blocks is really understanding what an activation could be for, for a family, right? Or just for an individual. When you look at the crisis cycle, there's always going to be an antecedent, right? A moment, and then that moment can go forward to an escalation. Activations are really what some people um, term as triggers. I tend not to use the word trigger um, for a variety of reasons uh, in, in my career and in my own life. So activations are really gonna be those situations, those events or circumstances. It could be language, stressors or environments that could potentially escalate somebody to the point of being in a crisis. So what could some of these things be? You know, we could look at a fight or a disagreement could be an activation that could escalate a crisis. Um, feeling of a loss of power, loss of control, um, illness, stressors at work or school or at home. We could look at um, different types of relationship challenges, changes in structure or routine, lack of sleep. All of these situations, right? All of these circumstances could be an activation that could start getting us up that crisis cycle, right? Until we are in um, an absolute, again, go back to uh, the slide previous, in a moment of danger, stressor, or trouble. Now, for me, you know, I like to use a lot of stories, and I'll probably use them throughout this, this time together. But really, you know, like in our uh, family, an activation really did flow around the perception of loss of power and control. When somebody felt that they were being controlled by another, it, it heightened that fight, flight, freeze response, and that started to escalate us into a crisis. Now, how do we know some of these things that are coming? It's really around those signs and symptoms, those signs and symptoms like those red flags of that a crisis might be coming, that activations might be escalating, right? I like to kind of term it like this, like what's making my spidey senses tingle? Those spidey senses, like I'm seeing something, I'm uh, sensing something, that this is escalating to what I am extremely concerned is going to be a full-blown crisis, a full-blown crisis cycle, right? So when we're talking about families and crisis planning, one of the, uh, the key components I hope y'all hear is that families and caregivers who are raising children, raising youth with uh, and young adults with mental health or behavioral health challenges, right? We live this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, okay? This is an everyday thing. And with that personal knowledge, that 24 seven lens, um, you really start to become attuned, really, really attuned to changes in tone, changes in behavior, body language, environments that could be uh, a big sign or symptoms, have those red flags that could increase concern 
that a crisis might be imminent or might be coming, right? Some of those protective, uh, proactive kind of signs and symptoms. So you might be saying, riddle me this, Batman. Why is Shauna telling us all this stuff about crisis and activations and around signs and symptoms? Because the core to family-led crisis planning really at its center is with the understanding and the validity and the validation that a crisis and what could lead to it, those activations and what those signs and symptoms can be, is going to be absolutely different for everyone, right? It is going to be individualized to each unique child, each unique young adult, each unique family, parent, caregiver. And when we're looking at doing comprehensive crisis planning, when we're looking at being family driven and family led, this has to be our lens. When we get into checklist menus, or I did this with the Smith family, so it's going to work with the Jones family, or even for us as parents and caregivers in the room, if we think, hey, this worked for them, or this was a crisis for my neighbor or my best friend or my sister or my cousin, um, we get outside of the knowledge of individualized, uh, individualized care for each of our families and for ourselves. So really keeping that as the core, the center and the foundation that it is very individualized to each family. What a crisis is, what leads to it, as well as what are the signs and the symptoms that a family might discuss with you that needs to be addressed. Okay, well, I'm gonna open the chat real quick because I wanna be sure that I am catching anything in here real fast. Just some more hellos. Oh, great. A lot of people from Washington, some Portland. Again, thank you for being here. Now that we have had um, just a couple moments to look at kind of the core components of what is a crisis and how could they maybe be activated, and again, really looking at the individualized nature to it, let's talk a bit about the difference between what is crisis stabilization and what is crisis planning? Sometimes in mental health work or support work, or for those of you here who support youth and families, right? In the work you do or the lives you lead, we can get unintentionally caught up in thinking we are doing crisis planning when what we are really doing is crisis stabilization. And there is a difference, right? Um, and especially for those of you who might have contracts or grants or funding or program deliverables that say, hey, you know, your family's here, you've got 24 hours to make a crisis plan, or you've got 48 hours to make a crisis plan, or 72 hours to make a crisis plan with them. This can actually end up really problematic because I bet if I could see y'all right now and we could raise our hands with this question, I mean, how many of you in your field don't have families come to, for you, come to you for support and services, you know, when things are kind of, sort of, maybe going to go bad, right? They, they possibly could go into crisis. No, most of us, if you're here in a peer support realm, maybe you're here and you work in the emergency room or you work as a mental health therapist or counselor or in psychiatric or in the school districts, right? Most of the time, many times, when a family reaches our door, they are in crisis, right? They're in crisis. And so we're going to talk about how stabilization is going to be different from com uh, comprehensive crisis planning, right? And why it should be different, absolutely. Okay. So when we talk about crisis stabilization, it's really... <coughs> around the immediate reduction um, of behaviors or situations that are imminent risk of threat, danger, and harm, right? They're very reactive in its components. So crisis stabilization plans are reactive plans that generally focus on the behavior of one person, typically the, the youth in crisis, because we're talking about um, family-led driven plans who are supporting young people who have mental health or behavioral health challenges, right? It's all about increasing immediate safety in that moment. 
Okay. This is vitally important in so many cases, right? If I have somebody who's in, a, in an acute suicidality moment, I need to immediately work on some sort of support intervention or service to reduce that risk of harm, reduce that risk of death by suicide. Now, when it comes to uh, crisis stabilization, this is great when we need an immediate reduction. However, we also need to be aware and look at that reactive plans, right? They don't really look at the long-term skill building of families, um, the awareness building, self-efficacy building, um, and the change, the ongoing future change that a family might need, right? It's all about immediate symptomatic behavior reduction to increase immediate safety. And sometimes when we look at um, a one person focused uh, symptomatic behavior reduction, it can unintentionally, not intentional, but unintentionally send messages to other members of the family that they're not really needed in this process, right? It's about the youth in crisis. What are we doing? Immediate safety. We're done. Okay. Crisis stabilization. So let's take a look at when we're talking about comprehensive crisis planning, right? This is going to be a supportive mindfulness process. That's a key word here. It's, it's a mindfulness process that addresses the unique strengths and needs of each youth and family, right? We're going to look at goals. We're going to find proactive ways to dis disrupt that crisis cycle in times of distress, right? So that overall, we are proactive in, in identifying what we just talked about or what are those activations? What are those signs and symptoms a crisis is, is coming? And how can we build proactive strategies, proactive supports as hopefully a response to getting in the middle of that, um, that crisis? So when we talk about um, safety and crisis planning <clears throat> for families, we really should be looking at that balance, right? I'm a big visual person. So when I think about like, balance and crisis planning, it's all about teeter-totters, right? How many of you remember like teeter-totters? It's all about balancing the teeter-totter. And we should have a balance between some of those intervention and prevention strategies in a comprehensive crisis planning um, process. Both are going to be super important, right? But when we do system-led crisis planning, which, which is historically the foundation of what we do, um, and, and we're not really doing family-led crisis planning, they happen to be more heavily weighted, right? More heavy on the teeter-totter in reactionary work. You know, if ABC happens, you do ABC, bam, now, immediate safety. Now, why is this? It's a variety of reasons. There's no one reason, right? It could be we have a lack of resources in our area. Maybe you're in a rural area or an area where it's really long uh, ways away from certain resources. Maybe the family is still building their protective factors. Um, maybe we might have a lack of providers in our area. For some areas, this concept of family-centered crisis planning is very new and, and for some can be very radical. Like, what do you mean families can lead this? Like, they're the ones in the crisis. How do they lead it, you know? Um, sometimes families, uh, ourselves, we feel dependent on the systems that, that we are trying to utilize to get support and services and have really this conditioning of just fix it, just fix it, just fix it for us. Be our Superman, just fix it, right? And sometimes we just feel powerless for change. And for some of you in the room, you have an agency mandate, right? Hey, within 48 hours, I have to have this planning process done, okay? So there's a variety of reasons why we have more reactionary plans than maybe the balance of proactive and reactive. So again, you know, really looking at that teeter kind of analogy, when we're talking about family-led crisis plans, we really got to have that proactive and reactive balance within the plan. Family-led crisis planning should be tipping the scales back, right, in a very holistic manner. At the end of the day, if we are doing family-led crisis planning, right, either yourself as a family um, doing it or a provider supporting a family doing this, um, this process, at the end of the day, those plans will end up 
being more authentic, more meaningful, more usable, and they will be family owned, right? This is gonna not only strengthen the bridges between the family members themselves, but also between their informal and natural networks and strengthen the relationships and the bridges with the formal provider networks that they are using as supports and also increasing their management skills over time, their self-efficacy over time, okay? So again, remember intervention is in the moment, safety. Crisis planning should be a process, a mindfulness, slowed down, useful, authentic, meaningful, and family-owned process. Okay? It's not something we do on the fly because I have, I have to get it done in 72 hours. Okay? Now, let me pause here and take a look at chat really fast just to make sure we're not missing anything. I know we're going a little fast. We have so much information for you. Um, oh, we got Kentucky in the house, New York in the house, Montana. Wow, fabulous. Again, thank you all. So, okay. So we talked a little bit about what are the some components to individualized uh, lenses when it comes to family crisis. What is the difference between, hey, I, I need to stabilize immediate crisis and I need to do actual family crisis planning, right? When we talk about doing family-led crisis plans, at the core is what we call family-driven care. And I don't know how many of you have heard, you know, family-driven youth guided, family-driven care, person-centered care. Um, this phrase, these sentences are getting a lot more love, you know, around, uh, around the U.S., and really understanding it is the key to how we do productive work with families and meaningful work with families. So what is, let's look at some of the what's and why's around family-driven. At its core, family-driven means that all families should have a primary decision-making role in the care of their own children, Okay, as well as the policies and procedures that are governing care for all children in their community, state, tribe, territory, and nation. You know, the, the phrase that usually goes with this definition is nothing about us without us, right? If decisions are being made about families, then families need to be there and a part of that, okay? And again, you look at some of the key words here, they have a primary decision-making role, okay? Not a secondary, not a follow, they are part of the team. They are leading the team. I have a primary decision role on letting people know, hey, what works for my family and what doesn't? As well as policies, procedures, laws, and different things that govern care for all children in our communities. Now, why does this matter? You know, why would we have family-driven care? Well, you know, families know what's working and what's not working, you know? Uh, every time I, I, you know, I'm still, ooh, Lord, my, we're still, you know, it's always on that journey. When it comes to my daughter, you know, we started this about when she was 12 or 13, um, this journey of mental health recovery and safety and stability. And, you know, she's 28 now, we're still on this journey. And over the years, over the months, over the weeks, you really start to know, okay, you know, I really thought this was going to work. The supports I had thought this was going to work. And it was a total blowout. Did not work at all. And then you get more information and you get more skills and you get more knowledge and you try something else. And wow, okay, that actually had an impact. But unless you ask a family, then you'll never know what they've tried, what they haven't tried, what's working, what doesn't work, what's not working. So when we actually are doing this mindfulness process and being family driven, tap into that family knowledge, right? What is working for you? What's not working? Families know what their limitations are, okay? We can be very realistic about, I can and cannot do this. We can and cannot uh, afford that. Um, this is not culturally appropriate for my family. We keep track of our services and change. I still have a huge file cabinet in there with all the files and you know, this agency wants this and juvenile justice wants that and uh, the school wants this and that, right? We, we keep track of services and chains and what's requested of us. A key sentence here is that family and youth comfort and buy-in is absolutely necessary for success. 
If your families have not bought into the support that you're giving and you have not bought, um, not created a relationship with them, a trusting relationship, then we are not going to be successful, right? We must must be part of our own plans because because then it's my plan, right? If it's your plan, then that's your plan. But I have no ownership buy-in for that. So for success to happen, families absolutely have to have a buy-in to this. Our experiences are holistic. And that's one of the things we are going to talk about moving forward is, is sometimes when we talk about crisis stabilization or system-led plans or the history of system-led plans, um, mental health system plans, uh, it's very a narrow focus on, like I said, um, identified symptomatic behavior reduction. Uh, one of the absolute beautiful things that is happening now is there's so much more momentum around seeing the family as a holistic unit and looking at all life domains when it comes to creating a planning process with the family so that they have meaningful places to go in the future, right, for, for safety and stability. Um, Families, we face this 24 hours, seven days a week, and we have credibility because of that. I have knowledge you don't. I have experiences you have not had, right? I have tried strategies in my home with my child that no provider would know because at the end of the day, you get to go home at five o'clock. I don't, right? You don't have to be there on the weekend. I do, right? Um, I'm the one who spends 72 hours sleeping on the floor of the psych room at the Salem hospital. You know what I mean? So we have that credibility and the ability to partner with you as a teammate leading the way to have a meaningful plan. All right. So what would it look like if we were doing family driven care, family driven care? So if we're doing family driven care in, in all facets of the work, <clears throat> Families should not be feeling judged or blamed because of their child's behavior. And I don't know how many parents I have in the room right now, parents who are uh, <coughs> currently or previously are raising children and youth or young adults with mental health, behavioral health challenges. But I bet if I did and we, we had a poll or raised our hands or, or had a moment, like how many of you felt that people on the outside looked to you that this was your fault, that your child had a mental health challenge? or that it was your fault that your child had, um, had uh, behaviors that were um, unsafe or concerning or a challenge, right? Because I know I did, I know I did, right? Family, providers, um, residential treatment staff, uh, hospitals, uh, counselors, you know, it's like, oh, it's my fault, I did something wrong. So when we're looking at family-driven care, Families can partner with you and we don't feel judged or blamed for our child's behavior. Families can actually ask for the services and supports that they need and still maintain a sense of dignity, right? Family-driven care means I am respected and I have dignity as part of the team, as part of this process. We feel valued and validated, right? Valued and validated, okay? When we do family-driven care, Families can express challenges, ideas, or plans without fear that you are going to alienate us or have retribution against us, right? And I don't mean you like you all in here, but like you in the sense of, you know, I can have an idea and not feel like it's going to come back and, and, and bite me in the leg, you know, uh, or, or somebody's going to think, well, what's wrong with her, you know? Uh, I can remember you know, times where I would have a strategy or a support idea, and I was so scared to bring it up to my support team, because I was so afraid of the reaction, because I did not feel valued. And I did not feel validated as the parent and the caregiver in this family journey. So this is what it would look like if we're all doing that family driven care, right? So Let's take a look at how we can put some of this stuff together and why it will matter when it comes to doing family-driven crisis planning. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking in the chat here too. I, uh, I've got some mutuality here with, uh, with some of you in, uh, in, in this room today. And I, I really bless you, you know, thank you so much for putting that in the chat that, uh, some, some of us in this room today have slept on the same psych floors 
for two, three, four days, you know, uh, while you're navigating crisis with the family. Thank you for sharing that. That was really vulnerable and very caring. Um, so when we're looking at crisis planning and we're doing it in an individualized, so let's go back to, you know, the start of this, when we're looking at it being individualized, when we are recognizing that there are times for stabilization and that's absolutely valued and needed. And then there's other times for crisis planning processes, right? Two different things we're doing, stabilizing and planning. And also understanding that once we start getting into the family-driven crisis planning process, <laughs> that the families we work with or, or the families, if you're here in the room as, as the, the, the caregiver, the parent, the forever person, that we have knowledge, right? We have great ideas and we have a right to have a primary decision-making role in the care of our children moving forward. So if you're here as a provider, you know, I teach this class, I've been teaching a, 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 a peer workforce, family support specialist workforce training for, for many moons now. And, you know, one of the things that I really impart um, passionately to providers who work with youth and families is just this realization, and it's not a negative, it's just, it's just validating, it is just truth, right? The families you work with, someday you won't work with them anymore, right? Someday you will be done. You will close the case. You will transition out a wraparound. They will leave the residential. They will graduate. They will, they will move forward and you will not move with them. So one of the beauties about crisis planning with families and the family-driven care and the, the um, concept of family-led um, crisis planning for those of us who are going to walk this journey for our lives with our children is that we build that self-efficacy, we build that skills, we build the knowledge, we build the resources with them, for them, by them, because eventually it will be only them, okay? I hope that makes sense to everybody, right? I, I, I live in the world of being, you know, having the lived experience over here, but I'm also a provider, right? And the families I've worked with, I'm not with forever. So it really is about empowering them to empower themselves. And we can do that through family-led crisis planning, because eventually we won't be there, but they will still be there. So let's look at some of these crisis planning processes and practice. Very, very first thing we're going to do is get a little bit nerdy, just a little bit nerdy. Those of you who might know me in the room and those of you who just met me, uh, I'm absolutely a research school college nerd. <laughs> so we're just going to touch a teeny, teeny, tiny bit on neurobiology very quickly because it absolutely has uh, relevance to how, when, and why we do crisis planning with a family who's raising children with mental health, behavioral health, um, or addiction challenges, right? So we're going to go through really fast. And normally in some of my other sessions, you know, we go through all parts of the brain and what's this and what does it do and, and why and all that. But for today's purposes, we're really just going to focus on um, the cortex. So the cortex, so you'll see in the picture in front of you, <coughs> a couple of things. You'll see that um, in the you know, lower half of the brain picture, you've got the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the temporal lobe, right? That's lovingly called the low brain. Then you've got your cortex that's lovingly called the high brain. Your high brain, your cortex, your frontal cortex, really is all those super cool, you know, high functioning processes that we have as human beings, right? We've got the cortex helping us how to learn, right? It is where we do our thinking. It's how we start problem solving something. It's where we have our creativity, impulse control, right? It's where we understand the concept of time, geographical location, distance, measurements, 
It is where we store memory with context. That's really important. Like the puzzle pieces of memories, the stories, what does it mean? Um, it is where we understand language. And it is also where we process and have judgment, okay? So the high brain cortex is where all of this awesomeness happens. Low brain, it tends to be your fight, flight, freeze, your, your low brain survival area. So when somebody feels or is in real or perceived danger, as well as toxic stress, we go into that, so you know, what they call the fight, flight, freeze response, okay? <clears throat> Whether it's real or perceived danger, real or perceived toxic stress, that process is innate in us all, right? It's a biological thing. So when this happens, an interesting, um, an interesting process happens in your brain. When you go into fight, flight, freeze, your brain secretes a chemical called catecholamine, okay? Catecholamine, kind of a fancy word for um, your, your fight, flight, freeze chemicals, right? Uh, it is a chemical that for good reason creates a muted conversation between the low brain area and the high brain area. So what does that mean in real life? So in real life, like what that really means is when I, be when I believe I'm in danger or I am in danger <clears throat> and I go into fight, flight, freeze, I solely work off of survival mode, okay? Fight it off, run, freeze, right? And I have a muted conversation with all of this awesomeness up here in the high brain. Now, why? <coughs> you know, think about running from a bear or um, trying to get away from a dangerous situation. I don't really need all this right now. What I need right now is to survive. What I need right now is to live, right? I don't need to problem solve it or think about it or decide what time it is, or start making judgments. I need to survive. I need to live. Okay. So this has real world implications for the families and the youth that we work with, right? Because if we are in crisis mode, guess what's happening to the brains of the families you work with? Think about it for a second. Okay. If you are working with a family who comes to your door in crisis mode, they are in current crisis. They have a biological reaction where they are not as able to connect with their cortex as when they can when they're in homeostasis and balanced, okay? So one of the things that I think is really, really important and I, and I hope you take this away is, this is why we talk about the difference between crisis stabilization and crisis planning. It is really, really difficult to say that you're going to be able to do comprehensive crisis planning with somebody who can't access, access fully their cortex, right? How are we doing comprehensive problem solving? How am I having good insight and judgment? How am I having creativity, okay? So you're asking a family to do mindfulness connected brain work when they are in a biologically reality moment where they can't have full connection to the cortex to do that comprehensive mindfulness work. Okay. I hope that's making sense to everybody. And this is why we say it's really, really, really challenging when your agency's organizations, or if you're a family member in the room, if somebody is asking you to do comprehensive crisis planning, when you are in current crisis mode, right? We're not going to get super far. We're not going to get super far. Okay. Let me check chat really, really quick. Yeah. Okay. So we got catacombing. All right. So once again, when we are in current crisis mode, and this is all of us, this isn't just the people we work with. When we have a crisis, a trauma or a toxic stress moment, right? That, that high brain kind of disconnects. We have a muted conversation with it and we have less of the ability to have the impulse control, have good perception, have good problem solving skills, creativity, 
logic and learning. So what does that mean? It means when we're doing comprehensive crisis planning, we really need to do it at a balanced time, at a balanced time when we're at homeostasis at baseline, okay? You can't do full planning if we're not at baseline. So if you look at the proactive crisis planning, uh, you know, model, crisis planning and building of those strategies with the family should start here, baseline. And we do that at baseline so that families and their supports, which includes you, right, we can work to disrupt the crisis cycle here at the escalation, at the activation thing we talked about earlier. Crisis planning should be at baseline so that we can have good strategies and supports to interrupt the crisis cycle before it goes full blown. All right. So pause here. Anything in the chat real quick before we look at the life domains, life domains. Let me check chat real fast. See if y'all have anything. We have any questions and answers. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Oh, okay. Doesn't look like we have any questions or any feedback or stuff in the, uh, Sarah, I did see that you have a question about access to PowerPoint. Yes. I believe after this is done, you'll have um, access to all the slides. And make sure. All right. Just a bunch of hello, hellos. Okay. Well, then we will move forward. Well, we, we're making really good time, y'all. Super good time. Okay. So, I hope we're all understanding, at least getting that foundational moment, right? That foundational concept that when it comes to um, crisis planning, families have value in the process. Families are experts of their family. They do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are a strong partner in this planning process, right? That their crisis is individualized to them what leads to the crisis is individualized to them and the signs and symptoms of that crisis is very individualized to them, right? Um, when we do family-driven care, it's about families having a primary decision role, right, in this process and that we do planning at baseline times, homeostasis times, teeter-totter balance times, right? Because if I am in crisis, I am not able at that moment um, or I'm in toxic stress or in that fight or flight, I'm not able in that moment to be a strong, connected um, uh, partner with you in creating a comprehensive plan. So that is just a quick review. <clears throat> so when we talk about the next component to family-driven crisis plans, it's really about making the systemic shift from individualized behavior reduction to looking at holistic intervention and prevention strategies with the whole family in all 12 life domains. So I don't know how many of you have heard about the 12 life domains, hopefully most everybody in here, but really what it is, is we are looking at, is there need for crisis planning? Is there need for discussion or comprehensive planning in all domains of a family and youth life? right? All domains of a family and youth life. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we are looking at the 12 life domains, we should be looking at, is there need for planning conversations, talks, or work strategies and supports in these life domains? So the first domain is going to be your emotional psychological domain, right? The next is going to be the social life domain for the family. Do we have any needs in the safety life domain, the educational life domain, financial life domain? Are there any cultural life domain areas we need to address? <coughs> any legal um, needs that need to be addressed? Spiritual, family life domain, behavioral, medical, home and a place to live. So let's pause here for one second. I'm actually gonna, gonna get a little juice real quick. And just um, have a moment together of why, why, why is this so important? And I'm just gonna speak to my own experience and hopefully that'll resonate with some of you in the room. And for those of you who um, might not have the same journey or similar journeys, <coughs> 
maybe it might resonate with maybe some work you've done with families. So like I said, um, in, in my world, um, I started being a part of, of multiple systems about when my daughter was 12 or 13, um, primarily around crisis and safety planning, wellness, um, wellness and recovery, right? Every time we worked on crisis plans, crisis plans, right? Um, the only thing people focused on, my supports focused on really was behavior reduction, behavior reduction, behavior reduction, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. Now, that was not inappropriate for increasing safety and stability, right, around the safety life domain for my daughter and, and, and my family, right? Because sometimes her behaviors cause safety challenges with the rest of the family. However, <clears throat> that narrow focus in looking at only one life domain really missed a lot of amazing opportunities to have a fully supportive plan that really was useful, meaningful, and authentic to my family, okay? Now, what does that mean? I'll just give you a real world example. So real world example, um, nobody ever asked me if I was having financial crisis and, and what we could do to plan around that. Nobody asked me if I was having a home and a place to live crisis and what we could do about that. Nobody asked about my mental health. Was I suicidal? Was I having trauma or PTSD or anxiety? And, you know, we, we didn't focus on that, right? <clears throat> Nobody asked about social crises, you know? And, and all of these domains were being affected in this journey that my family was on for my daughter's health and wellness. I was always, always on the precipice of losing my job. I, uh, I was a waitress at the time, putting myself through college. And as a waitress, you know, you don't have sick time. I didn't have vacation time. And when you spend a couple of days in the ER, you know, because of a mental health um, uh, spiral or mental health crises, you don't cover your shifts, you don't get paid. And there's only so many times you don't cover your shifts until your boss says, hey, we're going to replace you. Okay. When it came to the mental health crises, I was always on the precipice of losing my apartment. There is only so many times that the police or an ambulance or a fire truck can show up to your house before your apartment manager says, hey, you got to go. You know, we're, we can't do this. It's too much, right? Um, I had great needs in the social life domain. We didn't have friends. People didn't invite you over anymore. You know, happy hours were kind of non-existent because every time you try to get together with your girls or your friends, you know, crisis happens and you have to leave. Okay. I was isolated. I was lonely. My family was traumatized. And I will just be honest with you all. You know, I had my own mental health struggles that started emerging, including thoughts of my own suicidality, right? Because the trauma is real. The trauma is real. So now why am I telling you all this? <clears throat> because it's not that people did anything wrong in the sense that, that they intended to do harm. But what we did is we missed an opportunity to look at all 12 life domains. Okay. And missing looking at all 12 life domains in a family means we are missing crisis or stressors or toxic stress that we can address as the supports, as the service providers. Okay. So when you are working with a family, one of the things I really encourage you to do is as you are working towards family driven comprehensive crisis plans, start looking at all these life domains. Okay. Is there a need in educational? Is there a need in the legal life domain? Is there a need in the place to live life domain? Is there a need in the financial life domain? Now, if there's not a need, great. Don't make one up, okay? But if there is a need and you open that door and that opportunity to put it as part of the comprehensive crisis planning, then you are doing full holistic work that actually benefits the entire family right? Healthy place to live, financial security, supportive caregivers, right? Balanced family, all assist in um, supporting the youth in the mental health system or the one, the mental health crisis. So always look at the 12 life domains. That's tip number one. All right. 
<coughs> Let's see if we have anything in chat. I think we are good. All right, so let's start looking at knowledge, skills, and abilities. So if this is important, we're doing it at a safe, um, safe and balanced times. And uh, we are addressing all 12 life domains in our planning process. How do we do the planning process? So here are the best practice, knowledge, skills, and abilities when it comes to doing comprehensive crisis planning that is family driven and family led. Okay. So number one, number one is always going to be number one. Plans should be made at a safe and calm time. Plans should be made at a safe and calm time, right? If I am in current crisis, in current toxic stress, I don't have full access to my, my cortex, my frontal cortex, and I'm not going to be as strong in that planning process with you. And if this is family driven, I have a right to be a strong partner with you in this planning process, right? Nothing about us without us, nothing about us without us. Wherever decisions are made about families, families have a right to engage and be there, right? Full participation. So that's number one. Second thing we should be looking at is families should lead this process, okay? What does families leading mean to you? right? When I say, hey, families need to lead the process, what does that mean? Well, really what it should be meaning is that if, if we're doing um, like old system led kind of crisis planning work, then we are leading the process, okay? And when we are leading the process, there is potentiality that we are coming up with strategies, supports, ideas, and services that we might do or we think would be best if we were in the same situation or in those people's shoes. But that gives a false sense of security, right? That gives a false sense of uh, confidence that harm is going to be reduced because I believe that it's a good strategy. When families lead, then we start identifying what do families think is a good strategy? What do families believe is going to reduce harm and risk within their family, right? It's really around um, doing plans with, not doing plans for families, okay? Now, when families lead, <clears throat> they will have more buy-in in the plan you create. When families lead this process, they will have more ownership in the plan that they create, okay? When families lead, they're gonna see the plan as more useful and it's gonna have more value to them. Cause I'm just gonna lay a truth bomb on y'all right now, real quick. You know, and, and the truth bomb is, if a family does not find the plan useful, valuable, or if they will not do it, then we are wasting our time, okay? If you are creating plans that will not be used, then what is the point in creating the plan in the first place, okay? So when families lead, we should be asking what is useful, what is going to be used, what is meaningful to you, what is authentic to your family, right? <clears throat> and some of this is even asking families, you know, what does crisis even mean to you? You're gonna get multiple answers for that. Um, you might be really surprised what families determine is a crisis and is not a crisis. So the next thing we're gonna look at is identifying who would like to be active in the crisis planning process, right? So we're gonna do it at a, at a safe and calm time, okay? Families are gonna lead the process, right? Not us. What do you wanna do? What is your goals? What are the strategies you wanna try? And we're gonna talk about those two in a, in a moment. Um, what, what is useful to you? What is meaningful to you? What will you actually do, right? Because if you ain't gonna do it, why am I putting it on a piece of paper? Does, does that piece of paper make me feel better or does that piece of paper reduce risk for that family? And in the world that I work in, you know, in family support services, I want that plan to actually, at the end of the day, reduce risk, right? And reduce harm for that family as it builds skills, knowledge, and abilities for that family. So we wanna start looking at who wants to be active and who wants to be a part of the crisis planning process. So <clears throat> first key concept, participation is a choice. Choice, 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 right? 
I'm sure most, if not all of you in, um, in this room, either work for, study, or um, look into trauma-informed care, right? Trauma-informed care is about policies, procedures, actions, agencies, organizational change that gives what we call the three C's, right? Choice, control, and connection in a safe space, right? So who does and does not want to be a part of the planning process should always be a choice, okay? Some people are going to want to, some people are not going to want to, right? Avoid power struggles. Power struggles do you no good, right? Power and control is not going to give the family ownership of their plan, okay? <clears throat> so we don't want to have power struggles over that. Be mindful that there's going to be future opportunities, right? When it comes to comprehensive crisis planning, especially with a new family that you are working with, plan A is probably not going to be it. You're going to do plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, right? Because things change, skills change, goals change, humans are complex, right? Situations change, okay? So be mindful that if somebody doesn't want to participate now, they might want to participate in the future. That's okay, right? Um, some people might be ready to do more in the planning process than others. That's okay. Okay. Everyone can contribute, even if they're young. Okay. Even if you have somebody who's six, seven, eight, nine years old, everybody can contribute to crisis planning. <coughs> Excuse me. I told you all I was sick today. So I'm, I'm trying really hard not to cough, but it's coming every once in a while. So even young children can tell you what feels good and what feels bad. You know, have them do art, have them do um, some sort of modeling, have them be a part of it, even in the smallest of ways. I feel better with, I feel yucky here. This makes me happy. This makes me sad, right? Everybody should be able to contribute, even young children. And, and, and start to shift the lens around resistance, okay? If one person is resistant and doesn't want to participate, then, you know, <clears throat> start seeing the lens of future opportunities, future, um, future work, okay? If the whole family is resistant to doing crisis planning, find out why. Ask questions, dig deeper, get curious, you know? There are many families like myself, and I don't know how many of you have ever gone to like a pure apocalypse conference or, or a uh, conference of people with lived experience, right? Addiction challenges, lived experience, mental health, lived experience. <coughs> there are many of us out there who identify as what, as what you call psychiatric survivors, okay? It is people who have identified that some supports and services have caused trauma, okay? And trauma is very real and trauma lives in the body and it lives in our brain, our emotions, our spiritual, our energy. And so there could be resistance because of previous harm. So let's get curious. Let's dig deeper. Let's ask, let's talk about it, right? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Why? You know, I know this is, this is, maybe something you've done before. Tell me about that experience and what did not feel supportive about that. And how can we team up together as partners to make this a more supportive, useful, meaningful, and authentic process, right? Because at the end of the day, it has to be something that you'll use, right? So one second, we've got something in chat. Okay, all right, okay. So that, so we've got calm in a safe time. Families need to lead, right? They do this 24 seven. We get to go home at five. We're not there on the weekends and identify who would like to be a part of the process and always keep a strengths based lens. Future opportunities will happen. Maybe as the family has success, then we'll be more engagement, more engagement, more engagement. <clears throat> the next part that, that really is kind of like radical for, for some of us is identify what the family wants to work on, right? What's most important to them? This is going to be so individualized, y'all, and it really is going to be important. So 
you're going to have some families that are not ready for comprehensive crisis plans, right? Right now, what is super important to them is an acute phase, right? Or a hospitalization phase. And in this moment for this family at this time, your crisis plan is going to be super short, super small, and that's okay, right? It's going to be a bit of that kind of intervention more than the prevention or proactive. And that's all right, because we're going to let the family lead and then we'll have opportunities in the future. You might have a family who is super, super concerned with behaviors at school, but they're not super concerned right now with behaviors at home. Even though you might think that we should be working on behaviors at home, <clears throat> what the family is telling you is, here's where I am poised for action. I am ready to do work put in the time, put in the planning, and take action on these behaviors at school. And I'm telling you, I'm not ready for action on the behaviors at home. Take it and run with it, okay? Because it is a place to start. And then maybe once we start getting success in the school behaviors, or we start having great um, reduction of harm or reduction of risk in the school behaviors, then we have opportunities to talk about the home again, right? Where's the family ready? Where are they poised for action and what is most important to them in this moment? Okay. <clears throat> always, always, always. What's number one, number two, number three, number four. What do you want to work on? What will you work on? Okay. Because if they're not going to work on it again, it's not going to be, it's not going to be much. And always be, remember to be sensitive to the timing and the readiness, right? Most of you probably know like the stages of change model, but what is the timing, the circumstances and the readiness for the family and then let them guide on what they're ready to work on. Okay, <coughs> history, 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 very important. When you are identifying who wants to work on a plan, you've got those people, they're ready to rock and roll. You're having conversations about like, okay, what is most important to you? What's the hierarchy of what we want to have a planning process? Do you want to do larger plans? Are we in a smaller plan, like more acute phase right now? Um, what environments, what uh, situations, what behaviors are most important to you right now? Let's start looking at strategies. And when you're looking at strategies with the family, the past is your friend, okay? The past is your friend. What has worked for that family? What has not worked, okay? Let me tell you, let me tell you a story. So when we were doing um, strategies to try to do health and healing for my family, <coughs> you know, systems typically, especially if you're doing like residential or state hospital level care or locked facilities, yada, yada, yada. Um, in my experience, I won't say it's everybody's experience. In my experience, it is very, very atypical to have a checklist menu of what you need to do to get supports and services from, from that agency, organization, or profession. And some of those checklists are, you know, like individual therapy, family therapies, CBT, DBT, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, med management. Yeah. And, you know, the list goes on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So when we looked at like comprehensive planning, one of the things that was working really, really well for my family was individual therapy, right? We'd go our separate ways. We'd have our hour with our person, uh, we would have introspection and empathy and, and um, understanding and skill building. And, you know, my daughter and I would come back together and we'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And here's what I'm going to work on. And we, I love you and I love you. And we're going to, we're going to team up and we're going to do this together. We can do this. <clears throat> and then we would have family therapy. Oh my goodness. Family therapy was like a bomb went off. Absolutely. Finger pointing, anger, resentment, uh, venom, and blaming and shaming. And, you know, and I, and I'm not against family therapy, but when we look at individualized strategies, right, for families, and we see families as holistic units who lead the process, we have to ask what worked and what didn't work. And for my family and my journey, individual therapy worked really well. Family therapy did not work really well. So that should have been taken off as a strategy, 
right? As a support. Because in that moment, at that time for that family, mine, right? It wasn't working. <clears throat> you can look at who has helped the family and who sometimes is not so helpful to the family, right? Um, what makes me feel better? What has made me feel worse? Is there an environment that activates me? Um, one of the things I learned really quickly that we didn't explore before, but we've got to go back to those life domains, was that there was actual geographical locations that activated and escalated crises for my child because there was trauma that happened in those geographical locations, right? So if I drove past a certain street or an apartment complex or a building downtown, that actual environment was a crisis escalation because the trauma memory comes back, right? The fight, flight, freeze came back and she went into complete survival mode, which escalated crisis like that. So we really need to start exploring these areas when you're looking at strategies. Now, and I hope that some of this is why y'all are seeing why it is a mindfulness process, right? We dig deeper, we get curious, we build relationships, we build trust, we have conversations with families. Crisis planning should not take you 30 minutes in an office, right? This is, a, this is people's lives, right? Safety, stability, health and wellness, okay? You can start asking families what services have helped in the past, what supports have helped in the past, what has hurt. And this one for me, if I could impart any question to ask for a family, I implore you, I passionately um, encourage that this is the one question. I wish somebody asked me this on my journey. What if you always wanted to try to help your family and your child, but you were too scared to say it out loud, or you were too nervous to say it out loud. You wanted to try it, but never were asked or never had the opportunity to say. Because many, many times parents, caregivers, and family members have a lot of ideas, but we are so scared of the shame, the blame, the judgment, so scared of the retribution we talked about just a little while ago, right? That we don't say it out loud. Okay. And sometimes there's some really good ideas. Okay. And let's ask, let's have those conversations. But this is where we should be looking to the past to help shape the present of crisis planning. All right. Find out what the goal is for the strategy. Right. And the goals could be really multifaceted. You could be looking at goals that are about preventing a behavior. It could be goals just around harm reduction. It could be goals about just staying out of the hospital or maybe keeping a job, right? We have to find out what the goal is to identify the proper strategies. Um, what, what does the family identify as a success? will help you identify what is the goal that they wish to reach with you as their supportive team member. And once you have those goals, based on those goals, who is willing to do what steps, right? Who's willing to do what within this process? And everybody can have an action to do. You know, the primary caregiver can have an action to do, the partner can have an action, the siblings can have an action, my neighbors had an action, grandma had an action, formal supports had an action, natural supports had an action, look into who can do what. Okay, who can do what? All right. Uh, the last piece is make sure that the plan is realistic, right? It's got to be realistic for the family for it to be usable, okay? Um, are the goals realistic? Is, the, uh, is it following within family culture, right? It's staying within the family's culture and norms and values and beliefs. Um, is it realistic to their resources? Is it realistic to their finances? Is it realistic to their environment? Is it realistic to their um, developmental, uh, developmental uh, processes? Is it realistic to physical abilities? So we really have to make sure that whatever we're doing actually can be done by the family um, in, in a very realistic, uh, positive way. Okay, so uh, with that being said, let's, let's do a, a mention about culture. Okay? Culture is absolutely going to matter in your planning process. One of the things I want to be super, super clear about is that culture is not just race and ethnicity, okay? Culture is everything about you, everything about your family, 
Okay. And we all have, have individualized cultures. Okay. So when it comes to family culture, it is what are their traditions? What are their norms? What is typical for them? What is the structure of their family? Okay. What are the belief systems? What are their celebrations? What is okay and not okay? And some of these conversations are really going to guide you into how to have a proper, usable, culturally relevant plan. Okay. So when you're looking at cultures, every family is going to have their own. So this is why, again, it's individualized. Uh, a family's culture is going to be about their strengths, their barriers, their language, you know, uh, what kind of experiences will be on the stage if a crisis event does happen, right? And what can be utilized when it comes to developing a comprehensive individualized plan, okay? Culture is going to affect how we react as a family, who will be involved, is it a public matter? Is it a private matter? And what resources are acceptable to utilize and not acceptable to utilize, okay? When you start to dive deeper and get curious and understand the different norms about a family, <clears throat> you know, it is going to matter in a crisis plan. Is this a patriarchic family? Is it a matriarchal family? Um, who makes decisions? Uh, who's with the child more? Are they private family or things, you know, dealt within the family? Are there spiritual considerations? Um, because honestly, you know, again, another truth bomb, if you create a plan that goes against a family's culture, it will fail. I'm just going to say that again. If you create strategies for a family to utilize in crisis moments that is anti to their culture, it will fail. Okay. And if it fails, risk increases. If it fails, harm increases, right? Culture absolutely matters in the planning process. We must absolutely talk about it, consider it, validate it, and include it in the process itself. Um, one cultural component to look at is family styles and preference for support. Okay. Does the family have more of a preference for formal supports? Do they have more of a preference for informal and formal mix? Okay. Is it more about informal and self-family management? Or do they have an absolute preference for um, self-management primarily? Okay. This is going to matter. If the, like, if the family has little to low to no belief that formal supports and services are going to be useful to them in a time of a crisis, then having that on a crisis plan is probably not going to be utilized. So why are we writing it, right? If I'm not going to use it, why am I writing it, okay? Um, some families have an aversion, like mine, um, for a, from a lot of historical cultural reasons where they are not going to immediately call law enforcement. And I see crisis plan after crisis plan after crisis plan where the number one thing on the crisis plan for youth and families is call 911. It's like up at the top. But if you are working with a family that that utilization is anti to their cultural norms, okay, or anti to their community norms, why are we putting it there if it's not going to be utilized? So we have to really have those discussions and dig deeper and understand what's the cultural norms, what's, what's traditionally utilized, and what would they like to utilize, okay? All right. And then also looking at the family's uh, culture around what type of coping skills. Um, do they like to use distraction more, mindfulness more? Um, are they self-soothing? You know, you can look at all of these different areas and y'all will get these slides um, at the end of the session. Okay. <coughs> so those are your best practices around doing family-driven, family-led crisis planning, right? Calm and safe time. Families lead the process. Identify who wants to be involved. Don't power struggles don't serve you. Okay. Change the lens of resistance to a lens of opportunity in the future. Uh, what is most important to the family right now? We will always have opportunities for more in the future. Uh, look at the past to see what strategies we should use in the future. Okay. 
Um, we can also find out what the goals are for the intervention and who's willing to do the actions on that particular intervention strategy. Look at family's culture that will guide you in proper crisis planning. Okay, let me see what we have in chat real quick. Okay, so let's look at some roadblocks, um, some barriers that can happen to having effective family planning processes. So some common barriers we see um, with the families and youth we work with and, and you know, and across the, the nation, across the state, is really a huge barrier is seeing crisis and safety plannings as, as a box you have to check off for an agency mandate, okay? If we are doing crisis and safety planning to make sure that I met some sort of a checkbox in my work and it's not at its core to increase safety, stability, wellness, and well-being for the family, that's a huge barrier, okay? Um, a barrier could be confusing crisis stabilization with crisis planning. We talked a lot about that. It's a barrier to effective crisis planning when we only look at one life domain. Be sure we're looking at all of them. Don't make a need if there's not a need, but we should be looking at all of them. Um, creating crisis plans where we are only relying on formal supports, right? Formal supports being people who are paid to be there, okay? Look at those natural supports, what's in the community, what's sustainable, okay? Community supports are sustainable. Um, a barrier to effective planning would be not using the family's culture in the process. Um, not letting the family lead is a barrier, right? Because we're, we're just making something pretty on paper, not something that'll be used. Um, don't, don't rely on one plan. You're going to have multiple plans, right? Things will change, right? We might have new goals. We might have new strategies. We might have new things to try. <laughs> it's a barrier if we're not checking in with the family to see if it's working. And make sure that you're not getting stuck in the, and I hear this all the time, all the time when we do technical assistance um, with youth and families around Oregon, don't get stuck in this mentality that you can only have one type of safety planning document, right? Be creative. What works for the family? I have seen really big comprehensive crisis and safety planning documents. I've seen them just in uh, laminated wallet cards. I've seen and I've created, you know, colorful, um, color-coded one-pagers that just go up on the refrigerator, okay? It can be 10 pages, it can be one page. But what, the, what really, really helps is make sure that it's useful for the family. I have a file cabinet full of paperwork that was given to me, and a lot of those are crisis and safety plans, okay? Some of them are like 10, 15 pages long. And to be completely honest and transparent with you, if I'm in the middle of a suicide crisis or a self-harming crisis or a mental health spiral crisis, I'm not gonna go look at something that's 10, 15 pages long, right? It's not useful to me, it wasn't helpful to me, so it sat in a file cabinet, right? So find out what kind of documentation works for your family and roll with it. Get creative. It's an awesome part of our work and our jobs. All right. So let's review, recap, and some extra tips and tools moving forward. Remember, create the crisis plan before crisis happens, right? Make sure everybody has access to that cortex. Create those plans when we're in a common safe space. Create plans that will be used, used, all right? Um, use the family's lived experience of past activations and behavior to guide that planning, okay? Use the culture in the planning process. Look at all life domains, okay? And create a plan that includes all family members in the needs and the safety and the action plans. Everybody can play a part. That really builds bridges and relationships within the family unit too, when everybody is a part of the process. Um, include people's pets. How many of you have ever created a crisis and safety plan that included the family's pets? I'm telling you, it's amazing. Check it out. It's so good, right? Pets are family members too. You know, I was just telling y'all how sometimes I had to stay three days on the floor in the hospital, you know, and crisis and safety plans for me should be like, if I have to be here for this crisis and I can't be home for three days, who's going to turn off my coffee pot? Who's going to feed my dog? Who's going to get the other kids to school? 
Who's going to, you know, like, let's start planning some of these things out because families um, have so many different complex components that we can include in the crisis and safety plan. And that makes it more family driven and family owned, right? Um, again, let the families lead. They are the experts of their family. And it is a okay, my friends, to have multiple plans. Okay, plan ABC might not work. It's all right. Let's keep going, right? Because families don't fail, the plans fail. And if we just didn't have the right plan this time, let's make a new one and keep going. Strengths-based, persistence, right? Optimism, family-driven, we can do this. Um, make sure that we're including prevention and intervention strategies, uh, that the plan will be visible and utilized, and always use voice and choice, right? Choice, control, connection in a safe space is trauma-informed care. Um, a couple of skill building opportunities we'll talk about really, really quickly um, in case you have a chance to um, see if your families want to utilize them. And let me get my, my little sheet of paper here. The very, very first one is looking into collaborative problem solving. Okay. So collaborative problem solving is going to be an evidence-based model that's it's been used forever lately. I actually remember being in an adolescent psychiatric unit many, many moons ago. I think my daughter was like 14 or something, and she's 28 now. <coughs> and the, the therapist was like, hey, we've got this, this new program, this new thing, this collaborative problem solving. We want all the families to go. And I was like, oh, you know, that seems interesting. And it's so cool to see where it's come now, you know, over, over a decade or so. So collaborative problem solving really um, helps us to have effective communication strategies, intervention strategies, and solve problems together, right? Sometimes we can't, sometimes it's, it, you know, they've got plans A, B, and C, and you'd learn all about that, but it's really about how to increase skill because it's not about a lack of will. Like people don't want to be miserable, right? Sometimes we, we, we just, we lack some additional skills to move forward in the type of life that we find positive and um, desired. Um, the next one would be the LEAP method. Um, this method is just, it's another comprehensive kind of um, collaborative way to solve problems, communication strategies, where it utilizes the, the four areas of listening, empathizing, agreeing, and then partnering on a solution, okay? So it's called the LEAP method. And the last one is um, getting our providers, our supports, our services, and our families integrated into ongoing skills, knowledge, and abilities, um, educational series, like a mental health first aid, a youth mental health first aid, or an adult mental health first aid, right? Where it can just be a, a, an online class now, we do that. And you can do in-person classes, but it really helps you to learn how to intervene um, when a potential crisis um, from addiction or mental health challenges starts to emerge or starts to get worse. <sighs> oh my goodness, we did it. We did it on time. I totally thought I was gonna take up the whole two hours. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna drink a little bit of my cranberry juice and I uh, feel like I went on a talking marathon and I, um, yeah, thank you so much for being here and letting me share this information with you about family-driven crisis plans. Um, this is so meaningful to those of us, you know, families like me who, who have walked this journey or who are walking this journey, because when we can build relationships with you, when we can build partnerships with you that are meaningful and actually increase um, our power and our efficacy and our ability to help our own children, that absolutely is everything. It is everything. Um, so for you to take the time out today to come here um, is an absolute blessing. Um, may you all have a wonderful afternoon. We will hold on here for one second. We'll have some information and some question and answer time if you'd like. But if you do have to jump off, I just want to say, may you have a blessed day. Go forth, love on people and uh, do good works um, wherever you are. Thank you so much. And don't forget that uh, we do ask 
to uh, take a moment to do the um, evaluation for our webinar today. The link is in the chat. I see one question in the chat. Um, the question is, can you share more on the family styles, the mix of formal and informal? Ooh, yeah, yeah, totally. Great. So um, one of the things I, I, I heard this quote a long time ago, and it really resonated with me, right? And especially from my lived experience, having a daughter who, who basically spent most of her life in residential care, formal support care, locked facility care, state hospital, um, is that you can't create natural skills in unnatural environments, right? And so when we talk about preference styles, it is around what is the family's typical norms, typical culture about where do they go for support, right? For some families, um, they might be very community private, and they might say, well, it is our go-to when it comes to getting supports and services. We believe that the best processes is going to be counselors, therapists, EMDR, um, uh, emergency services, hospitals, um, maybe emergency psych, acute, um, acute services, subacute services, et cetera. That might be the go-to because there is either a lack of resources or a lack of belief in the community resources, or they, or they just don't want a lot of natural supports being involved in it. There's going to be other families <clears throat> where for a variety of reasons, and you'll only know if you have conversations, right? You got to have conversations and dialogue. There's going to be other families for a variety of reasons who say, hey, we've been there, we did that. And right now our family culture is to really lean on our friends, lean on our neighbors, lean on our community, because for us, that's more sustainable when you're gone, right? I wanna build this network because this is my culture, this is my community. And when, the, when, when you are done and you leave, I will still have this protective factor as part of my strategy, support and services um, for the long term in the future. And some people want a mix of both, right? Okay, when this happens, I really want the paramedics here, or I really want the counselor, the therapist, or the um, psychiatric crisis services, or some of y'all have like mobile units. But when this happens, I really want to lean on auntie, auntie, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, neighbor, best friend. So, for, so it's, it can be a really big teeter-totter balance but you just won't know until you know, until you ask, you know, for me, I, um, and we don't have to get into it. Like, um, my culture, my historical like journey, I am much more probable to utilize family first and things like law enforcement or hospitals or formal networks as a absolute last strategy. And that's also because of my daughter's mental health. Once we bring those people in, sometimes it can elevate the crises and the spiral where natural supports don't. So you, you just got to kind of have those conversations, dig deeper, get curious. Great. Makes much sense to me. Um, I just want to scan to see if we have any more questions coming in. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any questions in our Q and A. Um, I do see some thank yous in the chat. Uh, thank you for your sharing your lived experience and knowledge. Folks are absorbing what you've said um, before they feel really ready to ask questions. It looks like yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for saying you hope I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like yeah, I'm on yeah, the yeah. upswing. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, I sure hope so. So um, I'm just going to let's see. fast forward to my slide that says, again, please take a moment to look in the chat for that email survey. Don't worry, we'll also send you an email with that evaluation survey link so you can't miss it. And we look forward to connecting with you. We're on social media. We have a website. We have a newsletter. Um, and finally, um, are there any further thoughts you'd like to share with us, Shauna? Um, final wrapping uh, up? No, just thank you for the work you do. If you if you are here in the capacity as a, as a family member raising a child with mental health challenges, um, I just want you to know you're not alone. You are strong. You are capable. You are awesome. Um, and so many are on this journey with you, right? And we believe in you. 
right? We believe in you. You've, you've got this. And, and there's so many supports out there. Find, find your local supports. If you are in this room in a capacity as a provider or a support to youth and families, I also thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, we can't do this alone. Yes, families lead. Yes, families are the experts of their family, but that doesn't mean we don't need you, right? We still have so much to, to learn and grow in and to become stronger and stronger every day, every year, um, every moment. And um, you being here and being a part of that process is, is a blessing and, it's, um, and it's, it's greatly needed. And I thank you for even wanting to learn about how to do that in a more family-friendly, family-driven way, because we're all partners in this together, right? We're all partners in this together for healthy families, healthy communities, healthy states, healthy nations. So, so um, I appreciate you all. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Shauna, so much for your time today, for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, uh, your lived experience. We look forward to um, seeing you in July for another installment with um, the same family-led crisis planning theme. And uh, we are also hosting a similar presentation uh, this week and in July um, from your organization, uh, Oregon Family Support Network. So folks, if you haven't had a chance to check out our website or and see our calendar, um, we are offering some more family peer themed uh, I, uh, presentations in June and July. So we hope you, you'll join us there. Thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful day.